All right. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for tuning in today for the Southwesterners Forum. My name is Chloe Purcell, and I'm a Master's of Divinity student here studying biblical counseling. I'm joined today by one of my professors, uh, a mentor to me, and also a friend, Dr. Lily Park. How are you today? I'm doing good. 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 Why don't you take a moment to go and introduce yourselves to all of our viewers, tell them who you are, what you do, what you're passionate about. So I'm Lily Park, and I've been uh, doing biblical counseling for about 20 years now. <laughs> and um, this is a topic that's near to me with grief and suffering, not only through my own family sufferings, but also people I've met in the church and through counseling who have gone through various kinds of suffering. So I'm glad we're having this topic. I get asked this question often by pastors who email me and, or call me for uh, recommendations and guidance. So I hope this is helpful for all of you and we will try our best to um, answer your questions thoughtfully and biblically. Perfect. So yeah, grief and suffering is something that as believers, we are going to experience. Um, the moment we become believers, it doesn't mean that this life gets easy. Um, sometimes it means it actually gets significantly harder. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Park, why don't you just start us off by talking about the basics mm -hmm. of grief and suffering, um, mm -hmm. maybe the basic theology behind that yeah. um, today? Yeah, I think when <clears throat> uh, one of the common issues I encounter when I meet with people who are suffering or grieving is this um, conflict they have as a Christian and the conflict is, if I am a Christian, why am I suffering? And even though they might have heard sermons that the Christian life is uh, full of suffering and even persecution for your faith, when it happens to you uh, and it's so personal and painful, we have mature, spiritually mature, even people with PhDs in theology, it really shakes their faith at times to think about who is God? Why is this happening? Did I do something to deserve this? And one passage I like to just encourage them is that this world is broken. It's, it's not the way that God created it to be. It's full of sin and we use 828 often, Romans 828, but I don't think we look ahead before it enough. It says, Romans 822, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Not only that, but we ourselves who have the spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Now, in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen does not hope. Because who hopes for what he sees? Now, if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. I think that's helpful to see that we don't suffer necessarily because we have sinned sometimes, but sometimes we suffer because we live in a world that is groaning and waiting for the return of Christ. And when we will have perfected bodies and no more, no more illnesses, no more cancer, no more death. So I like to put that perspective, the big picture, that um, instead of isolating into why you're suffering is why we have suffering in the first place is because of sin in this world. Absolutely. And ultimately, at the heart of biblical counseling, we look at the sin issue. Mm -hmm. what's going on in the heart, what's going on, mm -hmm. uh, why we suffer to begin with. And it's ultimately because of sin. And that is the entire point of studying mm -hmm. biblical counseling is yeah. to get to that heart. So I love that you mentioned that. Mm -hmm. So today's topic also is very applicable for the church, the mm -hmm. church as a whole. Um, Dr. Park, how do you feel the church has done a good job in addressing grief and suffering? And what are some areas that you think the church needs to improve? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, um, and certainly this is case by case situation, yes. but I think churches do a good job of teaching about uh, trust God, trust God and um, persevere in your faith and even um, encouraging people in their suffering to 
turn to God for comfort, like in 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3, talks about. But I think there's this, the theology, the Bible answer, and it doesn't get translated practically in ways that are always helpful. Mm. And I don't think it's because they're not wanting to be helpful. I think people intend well. They have mm. good meanings, good intentions. But what I hear from people is sometimes they're even more hurt because of the lack of response or the words that we say. So I think the church does a good job in having good intentions, but I think a way that we can do better is um, approaching people, not in trying to fix their problems. Mm. And I think that's where the emails come in and the phone calls of what do I say? Mm. What do I do to make it go away? And we can't do that, as you know, right? right. It's the God of our all comfort, mm. but we can, point people to the God of all comfort. And I think part of that is asking them questions mm -hmm. of what makes this so hard? And even some questions like, um, what do you worry about? Mm -hmm. Maybe some people are wrestling with their grief and suffering because they're thinking about financial payments. Mm -hmm. They're thinking about who's going to take care of my children. Um, so what do you worry about? What keeps you up at night? And then we can't just end there. How can we as a church come around you, alongside you, to alleviate some of the concerns that you have? Mm -hmm. I remember hearing this one story of a person in the hospital, and she is dying. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I think it was a student of mine who's a chaplain, and he asked her what she's afraid, what she's worried. And you know what it was? It was something that we might consider to be mundane. Mm -hmm. It was about keeping things in order in her home. Mm -hmm. And um, something that seemed so small was, was keeping her up at night, was creating this anxiety and so he was able to talk to the family members of addressing those practical concerns. So I think asking questions of what is it that makes this so hard for you can be helpful. So we're not trying to just give the Bible answers. Yes. That's, there's, that's, there's a time and place for that. Mm -hmm. But I need to understand you mm -hmm. as a person because I can know 10 other people who had the same experience as you but each person experiences that same problem differently. Mm -hmm. And if I really want to help you, really care for you and comfort you, I need to ask questions to understand your heart, but also your story better. Mm -hmm. And that will give me more guidance in how I can speak the gospel and relevant Bible passages and God's promises mm -hmm in a way that is meaningful and not just slapping a verse yeah. onto you. So I, I think we need to ask some questions of like, what do you worry about? Another good question is, what are you afraid? Mm -hmm. And I think even a more sobering question of someone who has a terminal diagnosis that they only have a few months to live might be, are you ready to die? And that sounds so yeah. cold, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But if we don't face the reality, we live in denial. Mm. And denial is one of those key problems, key struggles people face. Um, we need to help address the reality but and give them practical help, but also biblical hope for what they are afraid of. But I think denial is one of the common struggles. The secular world talks about five or seven stages, whichever yes. model you look at. Yes. But um, denial is one of them, right? Mm -hmm. And and you also have bargaining and and depression, and you come to the point of acceptance even. So, but the thing is, the secular model, you know what's missing? Hope. <laughs> There's no Christ in it. Absolutely. It's very much, you need to figure it out. You need to go through these stages mm -hmm. and maybe not in that order, 
but it's very much on you working through it. Yeah. And as Christians, I'm so glad I don't have to work through it on my own. Um, I don't have to figure it out. God will help me through the Holy Spirit in his word and godly people. Yeah. So um, I think denial is a, a common issue that we might encounter with people in the church. Yeah. I love that, you know, you mentioned the secular world because right. Dr. Park knows, but that's a big part of my personal story mm -hmm. coming out of secular psychology into a biblical counseling model. Mm -hmm. And you're absolutely right about mm -hmm. missing hope. And mm -hmm. if there's any pastors with us today or maybe watching this back, I want to mm -hmm. encourage you in that you have such a gift that the secular world will never be able to give mm -hmm. someone seeking guidance through grief and suffering. And that right. is a true life-changing soul-saving hope. That's right. That is in Jesus Christ alone. That's right. And you mentioned, you know, you, you gave so many wise points. I'm just going back through them <laughs> in my mind, but you mentioned, you know, as a biblical counselor, our role is not to fix people. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not to diagnose them, send them out the door and they are good for the rest of their life. Cause ultimately yeah. we don't have that power. No, we don't. And we will never have that power. No. <laughs> but what we can do mm -hmm. is as fellow believers in Christ to walk beside that person right. who is in grief and suffering, weep alongside them, mm -hmm. but ultimately point them to a hope that otherwise they would never get it that's or they right. would never hear it. So I, I just love that you mentioned that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a big um, misconception when it mm -hmm. comes to the secular world is, yeah. you know, the, you will be fixed and yeah. that's just not the reality, you know? Yeah. And I, I think, um, with that comes along with, we put a lot of burden on ourselves mm -hmm. as church leaders to be that comfort like we've yeah. been talking about. And <clears throat> I, I just want to encourage those who are church leaders here, even is your presence speaks so powerfully, mm -hmm. like being in the hospital with them, yes. in the funeral home with them, or just checking in on them at home or sending a card. Mm -hmm. People don't forget those things. Yes. And sometimes we want to, I mean, I, I love our pastors, but sometimes they want to give a sermon right there. And, yes. or sometimes our seminary students want to do that yeah. too but they're not, it's not going to register. Right. They're, they're emotionally drained, overwhelmed, mm -hmm. or maybe they don't even have energy. And yeah. so to try to concentrate, and so you don't have to feel like you have to give a profound answer. Job's friends were silent for like a week before they started talking. Yeah. That's a separate issue. Yeah. But, <laughs> but I think um, presence, the physical body lead presence can mean so much. And when I meet with you, let's say you're the one who's suffering, um, just even silence yes. can be okay. Mm -hmm. And maybe hugging you mm -hmm. or holding your hands and just say, Chloe, can I pray for you? Mm -hmm. Or Chloe, I'm praying for you. I think that can be very comforting. Yeah. And instead of trying to say too much. Mm -hmm. So I say in my classes, you know, comfort, don't preach in yes. the beginning. There's a time and place for everything. And now some people want scripture passages and everything in the beginning. And that if that's the case, then yeah, share those passages right there. But don't think you're not being helpful. Mm -hmm. You're not being useful just because you don't have all these um, eloquent passages mm -hmm. right there. Yeah. So it, it's so, in, I should say this in the beginning, mm -hmm. grief and suffering, especially grief is so individualistic. Mm -hmm. I think it is one of the hardest counseling situations mm -hmm. more than addictions, more than other problems. I think grief is mm -hmm. because we really can't, tell how this person experiences it. Mm -hmm. We don't always know what comforts them exactly. Right. And everyone grieves differently. It could be three months, it could be six months, and you go through stages of up and down. And so I think that's helpful to know is that grief is very 
personal and individualistic. There is no standard stage and expectation of this is where you should be at because it's four months now. So, yeah, you saying that brought up a question in my own mind and I know we'll have Q&A time, but I want to get my question in real quick. Um, <laughs> so you mentioned that grief is individualistic, so it's mm -hmm. going to look different for each person. Mm -hmm. But sometimes in counseling, mm -hmm. we have people who have been grieving for years on it. Yes. Um, where it's prolonged mm -hmm. and it's gotten to the point where it's impacting their walk with the Lord. Yes. It's impacting their, you know, if they're a parent and they have children, it's impacting their ability to love their family well mm -hmm. or be a good spouse. Right. Um, or it's just impacting work or it's mm -hmm. multifaceted. Right. In those areas. Where is the line that we as counselors draw with mm -hmm. this is biblical grief? Mm -hmm. You know, this is okay. Mm -hmm. And this is becoming unbiblical and it's actually potentially becoming sinful because it's impacting your walk with the Lord. That's right. Well, you know, First Thessalonians 4.13 talks about we can grieve with hope mm -hmm. for those who are with the Lord now, right? Mm -hmm. And so there is that human element of being very sad and losing a loved one. And I like to say we grieve because we loved much. Yes. Most likely I'm not going to grieve over someone who is, evil, right? I'm going to grieve over someone I loved tremendously. Mm -hmm. So I think that says that this person loved this person who passed away deeply, and we want to be sensitive to that. But on the other hand, mm -hmm. are you grieving with hope or are you grieving without hope? Right. And you grieve with hope when you remember that this person is no longer suffering mm -hmm. and this no person is truly home. And mm -hmm. there's a reunion someday for all of us in that component. So I think it comes down to having a lot of this worldly perspective and expectations and even dreams mm -hmm. that you have with this person, broken dreams, growing old together. Like I know widows who became widows in their early 30s because the husband had a brain cancer. And we don't expect those things to happen when yes. you're like 30 or 31, right? Yeah. So I, I think it's helping this person gently to turn, look upwards of what is our hope, that eternal perspective. Um, this, this grief is temporary. It's not forever. So I think we need to maybe start from there. Um, but also, why, what's keeping them grieving so long? Is it regrets mm -hmm. they have? Um, I think that would be important to understand. Mm -hmm. They give them the eternal perspective, but what makes it hard yeah. for them to not dwell on it constantly? And I think regrets is something that can be powerful, mm -hmm. maybe unresolved relationships. Mm -hmm. And so maybe we need to talk about forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want to go too digress or anything, but it's hard to reconcile with someone who's no longer alive, right. but you can forgive that person in your heart. Mm -hmm. And there's a sense of the peace that you have as you give that to the Lord. Mm -hmm. So you're not living in the past, mm -hmm. but you can live in the present and look forward to the future. Yeah. So I think I'm talking in the context of grieving the death of a Christian. Mm -hmm. But um, another thing is I remember meeting with a widow. She was in her 60s or 70s. Um, she met her husband as teenagers. They got married, I think, like 18, 19. They had a business together. They were married, I don't know, maybe 40 years ago. This is a long time ago, yeah. over, over 10 years ago. But she lost her husband two years grieving two years, two years before we met. And we met because things were starting to affect her functioning. Yeah. And this, I learned something powerful by meeting with her, which is this. I asked her simply, have you grieved the death of your husband? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden the tears just go whoosh. Yeah. And I just let her weep 
for, I don't know, maybe 15 minutes. I just gave her my tissue box. Yeah. And I didn't try to speak. I just let her cry. And she said she wasn't able to really grieve because she had to keep working, keep the business going. And she had adult children, but they weren't really supportive. Mm -hmm. So she just had, she was, dis she was keeping herself distracted mm -hmm. to keep going. And, and I'm thankful that we got to meet because it was, it was weighing heavy on her mm -hmm. and it was two years. So yeah. those are some things that come to mind with people who are grieving um, too long. Mm -hmm. what, what does too long mean, right? Right. But it's I all think, subjective. Yes. Right. But if it's been a, over a year where you are grieving as if this person just died yesterday, yes. um, I, I definitely would encourage that person to talk to someone mm -hmm. for counseling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So I think we're ready for some questions. Mm -hmm. Anyone has any? All right, perfect. So I'm just going to read it okay. because he added some details in here and I want to make sure we answer this thoroughly. So sure. Rich says, I deal with those in hospice and are dying regularly. Mm -hmm. I have noticed the commonality of dying people being unwilling to discuss their impending death and to spiritually prepare for this final experience. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are exceptions to this reluctance. How can we use biblical counseling methodology and tool sets such as facilitation and encouraging candid discussion by seeking heart issues? Mm. Thanks. Thanks, Rich, for your question. That's a really good question. Um, so we're, we're thinking specifically with those who are dying and they have a few months to live. Um, we, I think there could be many reasons for this, um, but one that is more common is denial. Mm -hmm. And I talked about that earlier. So I know your question is talking about the person dying, but I think it's also important to address family members and denial goes both ways. So let me start with the family members. Um, sometimes when people are dying or they're in hospice, it makes it even more hard to die. Can I put it that way? Because family members are in denial. They're saying, oh, you're going to be fine, dad. Mom, I know this treatment will work. You're going to get through it. And meanwhile, the mom or dad or aunt or uncle, whoever it is, or grandmother or grandfather, they're they're ready to die. They've been suffering a long time. And they're, if anything, they want to make the most of their time with the family members, uh, sharing good memories, um, singing songs and hymns, and maybe reading scripture together. So I think there's a denial that can happen when we're not facing reality on the family member's part. And I understand that's hard because uh, we love this family member. So we can comfort the family members, help them to know how to best help the person who's dying. What, what are the decisions that still need to be made? Do you know what they want to do um, for their funeral arrangements, things like that? And then for the person who's dying, there's a component of denial. And I can't tell you one formula or a simple answer, but I would want to better understand is there's this avoidance escapism from reality when we deny. And again, some of the questions I asked earlier would be helpful mm -hmm. in saying that we, we all die someday. Yes. And Psalm 139 talks about that. Our days are in God's book. And we don't die because we're in control. We don't choose. And nothing is a surprise to God. So helping this person to see that dying is part of life. We all die. But in your situation, what makes it so fearful? Mm -hmm. What makes it so hard to think about dying? What, what is burdening you? Mm -hmm. And I think that would be helpful to better understand some of their heart, but also ask them questions about their life, their past, their stories, because it's not just about understanding the heart. Um, again, the heart can be common issue with several people, but they bring different experiences, expectations. Like for instance, maybe someone who's dying 
has been healthy their whole life. They eat well, they exercise well, they, they follow all the rules about living a long life. And then they get this diagnosis and they just feel crushed. Mm. They think, where did this come from? And it's denial of, I can beat this. I just need to perhaps do something differently. So I'm just thinking that's a simple example of how this person lived his or her life can shape why they're in denial and not wanting to talk about death. So um, that would be some things to try to understand as this person's life, ask them to tell you um, what their diagnosis, what's been so hard about it. Is it the fact that they're not going to be with their grandchildren anymore? Um, So what's keeping them from not facing the reality? Yeah. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Again, thank you guys so much for the questions. We recognize that this topic is pretty heavy um, for many. And our next question is going to be a little bit on the heavier side. But Tommy, thank you so much for asking this. How would you help someone grieve when they believe their loved one died apart from the Lord? Mm -hmm. That is hard. And I think what we have to not do is give them false hope. Right. Um, that is not the way to comfort them. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I actually went through something like this years ago and losing a family member who I was not sure about salvation. But what comforted me, there's a passage, I think it's in Romans, where it says, God has mercy on whom he chooses, God hardens whom he chooses. And The reason why that was at least helpful for me with that passage is to understand, because I was having some regrets. Could I have done more to share the gospel? Could I have done more to spend time with this family member? Those thoughts were coming because it's so final, right? Mm -hmm. When someone dies. And that's why we should share the gospel faithfully while we can. But it's too late. This person has already died. And I don't know if this person as a Christian, but that was comforting to know that it's not me who um, has the power to save people. Mm-hmm. So I think that can be helpful with guilt that a person might have mm-hmm. who lost a loved one is what makes it so hard um, in your grieving over someone who's not saved. And I think another component is just that um, God is always good. Mm-hmm. God is always good. Even when something so painful, like losing a loved one who died without knowing Christ, we know the eternal reality of that, but we have to remember that hope in the midst of it, of who God is and how he is perfectly good. He is perfectly compassionate. And I think that can be a way to Again, we can't, we're not trying to fix that, right? right? But I think we can comfort this person with true hope and wisdom from more, the Word of God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And I love that you mentioned um, when a loved one passes, or not, not even a relative, but just anyone, anyone yeah. that we value deeply and we mm-hmm. question whether or not they knew the Lord or not, mm-hmm. those questions of, I should have done this. I had this opportunity and I I didn't take it. And having to recognize Mm -hmm. that, yes, share the gospel, do it, you know, but ultimately someone's salvation does not lie on you. That's right. And that is a very heavy burden to Mm -hmm. hold. That's right. It's a burden that you don't have to hold. That's right. Um, And I think that's a big comforter for, Mm -hmm. you know, people who might have gone through this. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, that's just something I thought when you mentioned that. I was just thinking, I think that's why my friends who are pastors, mm-hmm. when they are speaking of the funeral and it's for someone who didn't know the Lord, yes. that's hard, right? Yeah. But what they do is they try to share the gospel with those who are still alive, mm-hmm. those who are there present, because you still have a choice. Mm-hmm. You can still believe in Christ as your savior. So yeah, I think that's um, that's what we can do. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for your question. Let's see if there's some more. Perfect. 
Uh, Clovis, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Mm -hmm. uh, they ask, do you approach a situation differently when the suffering is the result of personal decisions? And they list alcoholism as an mm. example versus situations outside of the person's control, such as cancer. Mm -hmm. If so, how? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think that's really uh discerning because mm -hmm. we don't want to be a cookie cutter mm -hmm. in our approach. Uh, I think we can be more hurtful of like, what sin do you have to confess, right? right. And uh, so, all right, well, sometimes, so there's a suffering that happens because of sin. Let's go back to the beginning yes. of what we started out with. So we have, we have, sin, we have sinful people in a sinful world. Mm -hmm. You and I are sinners, yes. we sin. We, we sin against others, we hurt others, but sometimes people hurt us. Mm -hmm. And we suffer not because of unwise decisions, but because of ungodly decisions against us, right? So I think that if you are suffering because of a sinful decision, like alcoholism and consequences of that, well, the Bible says that God is faithful to forgive those who confess their sins. Mm -hmm. And so we need to help encourage them to turn to God and ask God for forgiveness of their sins and to confess their sins, ask for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you won't know peace. Mm -hmm. You're going to wrestle with guilt over the sinful decisions you made. And that's really powerful because guilt, if we don't address guilt, that can become depression, mm -hmm. that can become anxiety, that can become other problems, physical health problems, mm -hmm. um, struggling to sleep, having ulcers and so forth. So blood pressure, we can yeah. go on and on, right? Mm -hmm. um, now for someone who is suffering, not because they sinned, I think, um, I think even like someone who was mistreated, for example, uh, I think there's multiple responses. I, I would encourage this person that God will make all things right someday, because sometimes maybe they're wanting justice now um, to remember who God is. I literally share this with someone this past week. I don't want this person to live with bitterness mm -hmm. because of the wrong done against them. And if we're not careful, we can focus a lot on the wrong done against us. Mm -hmm. And it is sinful, it is wrong. But if we're not careful, we can take that justice into our own hands. Mm -hmm. And we can try to be the judge. We can be the one trying to punish people mm -hmm. in different ways. And so like, I think I would want to encourage them. I think it's in Romans 12, that God is the one mm -hmm. who will take vengeance. Mm -hmm we do our part to pursue peace with people. Mm -hmm. um, so I can comfort this person to not live in the past of what's been done to them. To see, and maybe it's how they see themselves. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's shame with that. Mm -hmm. um, and so we can talk about who you are, forgiven in Christ, mm -hmm. new creature in Christ. Yeah. Um, and same with the person who sinned mm -hmm. with alcohol, drugs, whatever it might be pornography, whatever it might be. So those are different um, responses, but pointing them to Christ ultimately for hope. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think it's important, you know, speaking specifically to when we are sent against. Yeah. Um, it's very easy, especially when it's hard, awful things that have happened. Mm -hmm. But even in the midst of those, you know, sometimes we ourselves still said and in class we talk about you know someone might have done 98 percent <laughs> that's right but we have our two percent that's right and why why would we not want to be free from that two percent that's right. right so taking taking the steps to walk in freedom even mm -hmm. if it's just that two percent you know taking those steps yeah um and and maybe we wouldn't say that in the beginning yes with someone who's been sinned against but later yes. when they are seeing god more clearly and they are uh, worshiping with the church and in the word, but also we don't want to enable their sin, yes. overlook, or say, it's okay, you have a right to be angry, right? Um, your child was hit by a drunk driver and that kind of thing. You're right, and I'm so glad you mentioned that, but 
there is a time and place. The Absolutely. Bible talks about that. But um, and we should own 2%, 5%, whatever it is, because um, sin is sin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we don't have an excuse for our sinful thoughts, attitudes, behavior, and words. Yeah. Absolutely. We can't blame others for our sin. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So I have been for marriage and family counseling. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a newlywed, so I've learned a lot through that <laughs> class. Um, but an unfortunate reality of some marriages is uh, miscarriages. Yes. So I would love for you to take a moment kind of to speak to um, how do we counsel a family that's mm -hmm. going through a miscarriage? Yes. Um, we recognize some families, maybe it's their first born that they miscarry or they already have children, they're expecting a third or fourth and then they miscarry. Yes, so how course. would you counsel based on the different mm -hmm. scenarios? Yes. I'm so glad you brought that up because that's a topic that is um, that I really care about. Mm -hmm. And it's not because I've gone through miscarriage, but I've I've known a lot of men and women, husbands and wives who have really hurt. Mm -hmm. And I, I sense the weight of that. And not just once, but multiple times. And so um, I would say with miscarriages is, I think this is an area where the church can, we can be more sensitive mm -hmm. about. And this, it's everything we talked about at the beginning of this forum of being not just trying to fix and um, fix the problem and mm -hmm. being so eager to help. Um, I would say, Every time I hear about someone's miscarriage, it's not the same as another person. Mm -hmm. And again, it's personal. In fact, I remember one woman at my previous church, we had a lot of moms. She said, it was, it was my single friends who were more comforting than my married friends. Mm -hmm. Do you know why? Because some of her married friends who had miscarriages were projecting their experiences mm -hmm. onto this woman. And sometimes it was even more graphic. It was harder. Mm -hmm. And it just added on to their grief because yeah. okay. they're going through their own confusion and hurt and questions. And now they're grass grappling with what another person went through yeah. in their, in their um, miscarriage. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to be careful of comparing mm -hmm. people's miscarriages and not be like, oh, well, Chloe, you'll have more children. Mm -hmm. Who's to say? We cannot make promises like that. Yeah. And or Chloe, you know, I know so-and-so and, -so, and um, at least you have three children. You know what I mean? And we say these things. We again, we intend to help. We yes. want to help. We'll do anything yes. <laughs> to try to say something. You have look at those yeah. beautiful girls or boys, and but it doesn't matter. Yeah. Like each child is different, mm -hmm. and you lost a child, and there's a deep bonding that happens as a mom for ten months, right, mm -hmm. approximately, and physically, there's a bonding that happens. Absolutely. And so we we need to be sensitive to that personal experience. So, but we, we practice the things we talked about earlier. Yes. Yeah, we, we, we be there physically, we share meals, we provide meals, we ask, and some people don't want meals. Mm. <laughs> Everyone grieves differently. And so I like to ask them what would be helpful and what is not helpful. Some people welcome meals, some people don't want that. Right. Some people want more privacy, some people want more visits. Mm. I think sending cards is always helpful, but keep it short. And another thing is when you drop off meals, just drop it off. When I drop off meals, I don't even ring the doorbell. I just text them. It's by your door. <laughs> Cause I don't want to even, I don't even want them to feel like they have to dress up or anything. Invite you in, that's host right. you. That's yeah. right. And I don't need drinks or anything like that. So um, I can see their baby later if they just had a baby. Um, I know this is miscarriage, but I think the same applies for those who just oh, gave birth. Absolutely. So um, seems common sense, perhaps, but I think we miss these common sense mm -hmm. um, cues. But I would just say miscarriage is is very personal, individualistic, mm -hmm. and being there physically and praying for them mm -hmm. is what I found. And also sending cards. Maybe it's a year after the miscarriage. I know of moms who were really comforted to know that, oh, 
I didn't know they remembered. Mm. And even putting the baby's name, I know of couples who had stillborns too, and um, putting the name of that child and saying, you know, we're thinking of so-and-so, we're yeah. thinking of you. And that can be helpful as we are remembering your child, even though he or she was never born or, or died too soon. Yeah. We're not just, this is going to sound harsh, but we're not just forgetting about them. Right. And on the other hand, we don't want to idolize their right. memories, but we want to remember them in a way that acknowledges their existence mm -hmm. at some point. Yeah. And you, you mentioned this the other day in class, and it really, really stuck with me. Um, you said that for these families that, I think it was one specific family, they their child was born and died a few months later. Is that correct? Oh, yes, yes. And, and they knew it would happen someday yes, soon. Yes. Yeah. And since then, you'll just simply ask, um, you know, what are you missing about so-and-so mm. today? Or um, what is something that you loved about so-and-so? Mm. Continuing to bring up their child's name. Yes. And asking them personal questions, mm -hmm. not like in an invasive way, right. but in a way of you know, letting their child still live. That's right. You know, even after their child's no longer here. That's right. Physically not here. Absolutely. And I, I want to be careful with that is the reason why I do that with that um, couple is because they told me that's helpful. Yes. So I asked, asked. I asked. Yes. That's right. I asked what's helpful, what's not. They said it's not helpful when people don't bring up his name. Right. Um, it's not helpful when people just don't talk to them because mm -hmm. they want to avoid talking about the elephant in the room. Yeah. Uh, I think for, for them, it's more helpful to acknowledge mm -hmm. what has happened. And they were grieving with ho hope, but it was still very, 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 very hard. Mm -hmm. It was hard, but I think I that was really helpful for me to know what's helpful not, because I didn't want to bring my experiences with other people into their situation. Yeah. So thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. The importance of asking people what you know, will help you. Seems so basic, doesn't yeah. it? But I think we just make assumptions so often. Absolutely. Or we hear testimonies of people and we think, oh, that was that's what worked with for her. So it's gonna work with everyone. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and it's like, no, that's no, not how that works. Because yeah. it's very individualized. Like that's we've been right. talking about, grief looks different for each person, how that's they right. handle it how they want others to handle it. Exactly. And there's a lot of care that they, they will sense when you simply ask, what yes. can, what will be best for you? That's right. You know, that's not, right. I'm going to cook you a meal, come to your door. It'd be best <laughs> if you invited right. me in, you know. Because I know this will help you. Right, right. right. So you know, what's best for them? I love that. That's yeah. really good. So moving on, um, mm -hmm. how would we counsel someone grieving a broken or estranged relationship? So mm -hmm. that can be, Friendship, family, mm -hmm. maybe a romantic relationship, sure. going into more divorce territory. Mm. Uh, this is a more broader <laughs> question, but go with what you want to go with. Okay. Um, and I'm glad to, you know, feel free to follow up on anything mm -hmm. that you might think of. Uh, well, yeah, you're right. That can happen in family and friends and so forth. Well, I what's been helpful also to see is um, there is such a thing as friends for a season mm. and so it doesn't mean once we are friends that we will necessarily be friends forever right. and be and have that same relationship. Mm -hmm. I think the dynamics of our relationship can change and there's a grieving that happens. Mm -hmm. So I hear this from others where the single friends grieve the changed friendship they have of their married friends mm -hmm. and, and especially when the baby enters the picture. Yes. So there's a changed dynamic of their friendship and there's a sense of grieving mm -hmm. in that change. Um, and not everyone, but for some people. Uh, but I think what's helpful is talking about their expectations. Mm. Well, what are your expectations of this particular relationship? Mm. And I think that can get us closer to why they're struggling so much. Because maybe their expectation was that things would be the same uh, and maybe they had a conflict and things are not the same after reconciling. Right. And they're wondering, are we okay? Are we sinning? And just helping them to see that um, there's wisdom mm -hmm. in um, 
approaching people differently mm -hmm. um, based on new knowledge you have about them. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that um, you're, you don't have a real friendship with them. It just means it might look different. And that could be with family members. Maybe they betrayed you. Maybe they shared something through gossip that you asked them not to. And so now you're not going to share as much with them. But maybe you used to be very close. You used to do all kinds of things together. And so there's a sense of grieving in that as well. And maybe even broken dreams. I don't think we talk enough about broken dreams with this. We talk about grief and suffering maybe with chronic health issues yes. or, um, or death. Mm -hmm. um, and even disabilities. Mm -hmm. But also having dreams that don't turn out the way you thought it would be mm. can be um, very relevant for what we talked about with grieving. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that's really good. Um, so yeah, again, very heavy topic today. Mm -hmm. um, we appreciate um, you, know, you attending, if you attended uh, live, um, if you're watching this back on YouTube, thank mm -hmm. you so much. Um, for watching this mm -hmm. back. Um, we hope that we were able to approach this topic with care um, because it is a topic that deserves care. Um, mm -hmm. And it is one that our churches should not shy away from. Mm -hmm. um, and not just pastors, but lay people as well. Mm -hmm. A lot of the stuff we talked about today, um, your normal person sitting in the pew can do as well um, and can take these things and go home mm -hmm. and strengthen your church and understanding how to better um, help those who are grieving and suffering. So. Again, thank you so much um, mm -hmm. for attending today, and we're going to go and pass it back to Becca. Thank you, Dr. Park and Chloe. I know I took lots of notes. I know this topic is, like they said, it's difficult. And as I was listening, what I heard over and over and over again is that we grieve with hope. And that is so reassuring. I like that the title of this topic was helping our church members through grief and suffering, not just in the midst of it, but coming out on the other side. And so that was encouraging to hear everything they had to say. Thank you for those of you who joined us uh, live and those watching it back. Once again, we are working on our fall calendar for the Southwesterners Forum. So if there are topics or ideas that you guys would like to hear discussed, please, please, please feel free to email them to me at alumni at swbts.edu. And our last episode of the forum for this semester is going to be in May on May 7th at 10 a.m. with Dr. Terry Stovall and Laura Taylor, and they're going to discuss the current state of women's ministry. So if that's something you want to join us for, be on the lookout for that email to register. And this uh, episode will be recorded and released later to you guys via email to watch if you'd like to watch it back. So thank you again for joining us, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>